Oke, okay. uh, welcome back everyone. Good afternoon once again and good morning to Mr. Matthew Palmer. Glad to have Hi, you here morning. finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, before we start uh, Mr. Palmer presentation, I would like to introduce him first to you all. Uh, Mr. Matthew Palmer is the operation director of TechRit UK who is the leading company in the design, manufacture, and installation of architectural precast cladding, serving the UK and Irish construction markets. Uh, he got his bachelor degree in Bachelor of Engineering, Civil Engineering with Architecture from the University of Sheffield, UK, and MBA from University of Manchester, UK. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Matthew is an accomplished professional with comprehensive experience overseeing, managing, and delivering construction projects. Matthew joined the Tech Creek in April 2021 and had demonstrated expertise in mitigating potential risks, reducing additional costs, improving operational efficiencies, and resolving complex issues. Okay, uh, I'm sure that we can uh, have very good uh, insight from Mr. Palmer. So let me invite Mr. Palmer to deliver his presentation. Mr. Palmer, please, the time is yours for the next 45 minutes for presenting and another 30 minutes for discussion. Please go ahead, Mr. Palmer. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> again, apologies for this morning, uh, internet issues. Um, just. Uh, just a quick introduction. My background is is more project management and operational management. So hopefully, I won't have too many of the the structural questions that were asked on the previous presentation. Um, now, just just I'm going to be trying to to summarise 15 years of experience into a 45 minute presentation. So uh, just just bear with me. Um, I think one of the the things that came out of the the previous presentation was the importance of planning. Um, you know, precast is, is very useful um, as a tool on site, um, as, a, as a method of construction, but the majority of the work has to go in before the elements arrive on the site, otherwise you won't have a successful project. So a big part of it goes around the planning and, and that planning actually could start even before, um, even before the project gets underway um, to do with the client. So, um, what I'd like to do now is if I could share my screen and start the presentation. Sorry, just, just jumped in at the end. Okay. So as I see it, we have I'm sorry, I need to hide some people here. As I, as I see it, there's four key phases to, uh, to, the, to the process. These are design, planning, production, and post-production. With this, if we start with, uh, with the design process, um, like I said, the, we start with the, the concept design. So this is where the the client and the architect need to start discussing with the, with the contractor and the precast as to, is the scheme actually suitable for precast? Because there's no, no point in trying to, to shoehorn um, precast into a project that it isn't suitable for. And then it's, if it isn't necessarily 100% suitable, can the project be adjusted or modified to gain the benefits of precast? Once that's agreed, we can move on to, to a, scheme, a scheme proposal. Uh, the scheme proposal would be where the, the precaster would work closely with the architect and the consultant to design the, um, the initial precast components and, and the structural system that would be used on, on the project. The next stage would move to, to development where the, the design then goes into detailed modeling uh, which would look at uh, both the, the structural capacity of the elements, the design, the component size, the reinforcement, and then into the construction phase where you would actually be looking at each particular element 
and preparing a fabrication drawing um, to show the, the details or sizes of the element and to show how the element would be produced. So that process of design needs to start from, like I said, the beginning where the, the client and the architect are getting involved. The second and probably the most important part of, of precast would be, would be the planning stage. Now, again, I've written here from procurement. So already if at the time that the, the client and the architect are looking, looking at which precaster to use, it's important to understand if, the, if that precaster has the capabilities and capacity to do the project. The planning would then move on to, to the molds that are going to be used, the erection of the precast. And I've put that in an earlier stage because the production and the transport rely very much on the erection as to, to how the project will be built um, in order to determine the production methodology and how the elements would be getting to site. And if we moved on to, to the physical production stage, we'd be looking at the type of molds that we need to use for the, for the panels we're going to be producing. Then obviously reinforcement, the casting, the finishing of the elements and the quality control that runs through that process. And then the next stage would be post-production. So this would be the storage of the elements prior to being delivered to the site, the transportation of them, and then finally the installation of them. I just want to run through the, the major types of precast users and, and the applications that they can be used for. I've divided them into to three main building systems. Um, the first would be a full system, a load-bearing precast structure. This is probably the, the most cost-effective way to be using precast. Um, what it involves is all of the street, all of the structural and possibly the non-structural components of the of the building would be precast. This would then be uh, could be the, the load bearing, the non-load bearing walls, the columns, the beams, could be your slabs, which could be hollow core, and then staircases. This offers the, the fastest construction method. It allows the elements could even be finished externally. So an architectural finish could be used onto them. It reduces the number of people on the site and offers the, the very high level of quality control that we get from a, a, a production facility. The typical uses for a full system would be a residential building, uh, commercial buildings, education and mixed use, which are best suited to modular, repetitive rooms and levels. The second system that I'd put down would be a column beam frame. This is where the, the structural frame is constructed in precast and infilled either with block um, or perhaps uh, other, other wall systems. And the shear resistance could be a combination of the structural frame as well as in situ lifts and stair cords. The, met the method of connecting columns and beams varies significantly. Um, it can either be continuous or simply supported or proprietary systems, which are bolted connections. Uh, typical uses for this would be commercial um, car parks and infrastructure, where we, we, again, the benefits would be the speed of construction, but also you have the flexibility um, of internal space where you can put walls to suit um, as you require using other methods. And again, the components for this would then be columns, beams, holocore, and possibly cladding and staircases. Final building system that I'd looked to was a composite system. Um, this is probably the one that uh, I'm mostly involved in at the moment, where you have a, an in-situ or a steel frame with a precast component added to this. The, uh, the structural frame would typically be in situ or steel, and then the precast components fitted to that either by uh, corbels or by bolted connections. Again, the typical uses for this would be commercial, um, residential, or multi story buildings. Uh, precast components that could be used in line with this would be holocaust slabs for flooring. So you could use. Um, in situ columns and beams, and then, then speed up the flooring process by using the holocore. You could use the staircases into the cores, or again, you could use architectural cladding. 
Now, the planning is going to be probably the most important part of that, and I'll, I'll try and look at it from, from a couple of different angles. Um, the first thing is, is the major, major pro parts of the process. One is, is high-level capacity planning. The second is the manufacturing stage, and the third is the installation stage. High-level planning is, is where the producer plans to ensure that he has available capacity uh, for the mix of products that is going to be producing on multiple projects at a time. Also that the, the materials that he would need would be available. And if he's producing multiple different mixes, or multiple finishes, that he has the capacity to handle those. And then finally, it's the timescales of the projects. Um, as we know, construction projects do tend to, to float, to move along in, in time. And it's important that he has uh, vi vision of that and is able to adjust uh, as projects might accelerate or, or move along in, in time, that he can still produce as required. Um, product, the production of precast tends to be operating on a just-in-time process, so we wouldn't want to be carrying too much stock in, in the stockyards. So again, it's important that we understand that the projects will be running and, and move it. the elements would be moving to site in time. The manufacturing stage would involve planning of molds, uh, the physical production plans for a daily basis, the materials, making sure that the materials to produce are available, and then the physical production on a daily basis. The installation plan would include the installation plan itself and the, the sequence that it would be happening in, uh, the zones that there might be, the loading schedules, so the, the order that the elements would be delivered to in site, transport capacity, the size of the elements and how they would fit onto um, onto the, the trucks that we'd be using, and then the erection phase itself, so the cranes, um, accessibility to the site and, and lifting plans. Again, going back to, to the beginning of it with, with the planning process, the procurement stage is, is vital. Um, on a lot of projects that we're dealing with at the moment, um, we are involved in, in pre-contract designs which are running two years before the project will, will actually proceed. And this, this part of the process is, is vital to ensuring that the, the precast is, is the best that can be used for the job. Understand available materials under that and the systems that are available to clients, the methods involved in, in how it would get installed, and again, the timescales involved in that. Second stage, like I alluded to earlier, which is, is capacity planning. Um, with this, we, we, we see that there's, there's multiple ways to plan. Um, there are a, a lot more um, ERP systems and enterprise resource systems and planning systems, uh, software that's available at the moment, and people are tending to use that, um, although there is still a, a big use of Excel in, in the market. Um, Unfortunately, that, that makes it very difficult to update. Um, producers need to make sure that they have capacity available. Um, so that long-term view of things normally gets done once every two weeks just to ensure that things are running smoothly. On the moldage side, the planning of the molds that are required to produce the elements um, varies along with the type of element that would be, would be produced. And it might be adjusting uh, the, the, the factory itself to fit these in. Molds could be proprietary molds, um, so they could be um, steel molds, or, or for a, a single use, it could be a timber mold. The, the installation tends to, to drive uh, the, the, the sequence. Um, I wouldn't say it determines the sequence of production, because ultimately we need to produce um, in a manner that's efficient. But it, we need to take uh, into account the sequence and phasing of the erection on site. And it will place constraints onto production and onto transport. So for example, if you had a multi-story building where your panels repeat in a modular way going up the building, that would be the preferred method of production. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that's how it would be installed on site where the installation could proceed um, around the building and going up in levels as the building progresses. Um, so in that case, you want to make sure that you're producing ahead enough that you are getting the benefit of reusing molds. However, 
still managing to, to maintain the, the, the timing that's required for the erection on site. On the transport side, again, it's, it's sequencing and grouping of the elements onto, onto the trailers that will be going to, to the project. Um, this places a lot of constraints again onto, onto storage and production as elements need to be grouped together, one in the, in the sequence that they need to be installed at site, but also on the capacity of what can actually fit onto the trailers. Just wanted to run through some of the productions stages um, and then onto some of the elements in production. Now, we, we, the previous presentation showed that you can you can have a, a, a quite a long presentation on one type of panel, um, whereas uh, actually there's a, a large amount of precast elements that, that are, are available. So I'll just quickly run over the, the stages and the types of elements that we could see and how they would be produced. Um, if we look at the stages of production, <clears throat> the first stage would be uh, the molds. So what would happen is panels would get divided into into family groups, types of panels that you're going to have, looking at the, the repetition of those. If something has a higher repetition, the mold would most likely be made out of steel uh, so that it would have a longer durability and be able to use more. Um, if it's something that has a, a unique, uh, unique one-off element, you'd probably use a timber mold. Uh, the second thing would be to look at the casting methods, so whether an element would be uh, produced with, with uh, a single cast or multiple casts, and that would also determine the type of mold that would be used. <clears throat> the, the reinforcement for the molds, for the, for the panels, uh, tends to be cut, bent, and fixed, and then fitted as a cage um, into the mold prior to casting. Um, if it's a multiple stage cast, there would be segmental cages, and they would be fitted together during the process. Uh, the casting and finishing, again, the method is largely determined by the element type, uh, the mix that's going to be used, and the finish that would be required. There would, could be multiple stage casting um, or multiple mixes, particularly on the architectural side, where um, having up to, to 30 different types of um, aggregate is not, not unknown, and each different mix would have a different, um, a different finish and a different uh, timing within the production. Then finally, I think, and a big part of, of the process is the, is the quality control. <clears throat> the quality has to, to follow the process and, and happen at different gates along the way. Um, the initial quality check would involve the molds, uh, making sure that everything is within tolerance. Uh, the second stage would be the reinforcement and any, any cast in items, making sure that they're correct. A recent development that uh, we've been trialing is the use of augmented reality and uh, overlaying uh, the, the, the model onto the cage that's actually in the, in, in the mold. Uh, <clears throat> the next stage would be the, the postcast, again, making sure that the panel had been correctly formed and finished as per the details. Uh, obviously, the, the, the concrete itself would be checked through casting cubes. Um, and, and then finally, the, 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 pre, the, the finish before it would go to site making sure that the element doesn't have any damage or any, any errors in it. But if we go through the actual element production, um, again, each, each element type would have a, a unique uh, method of production. And I could probably talk for the next two days on, on those. But if we looked at the, the key groups um, almost divided by their production method, um, Firstly, the main, the biggest part of, of any, um, any load bearing system would be the wall panels, uh, columns, and beams. These, these would be precast beams as opposed to pre stressed beams. They are typically produced on, on a table or on a bed um, with uh, molds. And you can see the top left corner, um, that's a, a typical table with, with a, a steel form to form a panel uh, using magnets. Um, so the, the molds would be set up on a table, and then again, like I said, inspected through quality. Uh, the reinforcement cage would be lowered into that, and again, checked with any cast in items. Um, 
they would be cast now if it was an insulated panel, which would allow um, a finished panel site, which has a finish on both sides um, and insulated to achieve the U values of the building. There could be stage cast. So the first layer would be cast, then the second uh, following the, the installation of the insulation. Uh, the finishing to that would uh, normally be a steel float or a power float and finish. Um, once, once the item, the element had been allowed to cure, um, the side forms would be demolded, and again, any quality checks that would be required could be carried out. The sometimes the panels would be lifted flat, um, or alternatively, the tables could be tilted to allow the the panels to be tilted, to be uh, loaded away. <clears throat> um, one of the things of precast is obviously high, high early strength concrete, um, so we'd be looking to to reach possibly between 16 to 20 uh, Newtons on the concrete prior to demolding, which could be done um, at anywhere between 12 and 16 hours. Um, for pre-stressed beams, uh, something which, again, the previous presentation went into quite a lot of detail on, um, these would be cast on, on longer beds, as you can see in the, in the lower left picture there, uh, where the, the, the pre-stressing strands are drawn across the length of the bed, um, and then the reinforcement cage would be fitted around that and the, the pre-stressing strands would then be tensioned up. The molds would be on, on the sides, put into position and then cast in stages along the length of the beam. Um, <clears throat> obviously for pre-stress, it needs a, a higher strength prior to, to the de-stressing of them. Um, typically that would be around about uh, 40 Newton, 45 Newtons. Um, which would normally be attained um, around uh, around 20 hours using a higher strength, higher early gain concrete. Um, the elements would then be de-stressed, um, demolded, and transferred across into into the, the storage areas. Um, the next type type of element would be um, the flooring elements, hollow core slabs. Um, these are typically produced using either extrusion or slip forming methods. Um, very similar to, to the pre-stressed beams, uh, the beds would be cleaned and the strands would be pulled um, along tension. And then the casting machine, uh, which you can see there at the bottom, would be lowered onto the bed and the, the, the entire length of the, of the slab would be cast. Um, and then, Following its uh, its curing period, it would be de-stressed. Uh, this would then be marked uh, to the required slab lengths and cut to length, and then demolded and taken to to the stockyards. Then the final element, uh, probably which is more relevant to what I'm doing at the moment, would be architectural. Again, these are produced on tables and beds. However, due to the nature of architectural elements. Uh, the molds would be more intricate. Um, you'd find the use of liners and forms, so something like, like a Reckley or a rubber mat. Alternatively, there could be a, a, a facing a brick face or a tile face. Um, also, there's a, a big use of acid etching or grip blasting. Um, so what would happen is the mold would be prepared and, and the liners and, and the form facing would be put in. Then the reinforcement would be would be placed. Um, now, as it's an architectural, you'd have an architectural concrete as the first layer, which would normally be a, a colored concrete or through colored concrete um, that would be cast first. And then there'd be a stage cast with a backing mix that would be placed in after. Um, this would then be cured as per normal, demolded. But the, there's an additional stage in here where you would have the, the finishing stage, which would, would, would be the the acid edge or the grit blasting. <clears throat> the next stage takes us then to, to what how it happens in, in the factory after the casting. Um, now, again, planning forms a big part of this um, where we need to, to understand within the storage, where are the elements and how are they, how are they going to be required and called off by the sites? So what would happen is, the, typically in a, in a stockyard similar to the one shown in, in the top picture. Um, the, the elements would be planned to be located by project type or by element type. 
So all of the all of the holoco here you can see are stacked in one area, and the wall panels will be stacked in a different area of the stockyard just for ease of access. Um, wall panels need to be stored vertically in racks uh, to, to make them easier to load on to, to the transport. Um, and some elements do require a, a special consideration on how they're going to be loaded and how they're going to be offloaded at the site. And that needs to be required. The, the management of the stockyard um, tends to be done through, through a, a bay and a bin system. So the stockyard is divided into two grid lines and then the management of that can be done through, through a system of barcoding, uh, which automatically uploads the, the panel locations into, into an ERP. Uh, so at any stage, you can find where panels are within the stockyard and, and manage them up. Uh, the loading of them, um, making sure that you have known locations uh, makes it more efficient to plan the loading. Uh, so the, the overhead cranes within, within the stockyard then can pick and carry the elements onto, onto the trailers uh, to be delivered to the sites. Um, on looking at uh, the transportation side, again, key element is planning. Um, we need to understand the erection sequence. And as I mentioned earlier, the erection sequence drives where we're gonna, where, when we're gonna produce things and when we're gonna have them ready for delivery. Um, so this erection sequence is normally put into to an overall plan, which allows everyone to look at ahead of time um, what's gonna be coming up and making sure that the elements are both located, cast and ready within the stockyard. The, the element size and shape um, determines how they're going to be transported. Um, you can see in this a very particular um, architectural element. Uh, so it, it can require a lot of a lot of thought going into this. Um, the the weight of an element of an element also determines how many we can place onto a trailer, as there are restrictions on on capacity. Um, an element like that, you would not get anywhere near the load capacity um, of a trailer. So that needs to be taken into account um, right at the beginning when pricing the, the transportation. Um, as you can see, the elements can be quite large. The trailers are going to be large and access into the site. Um, it can be a big issue, particularly on, on buildings where you're working within a large developed city. Uh, so we need to make sure we have access routes available um, and that the, the, the trailer can stop in a, in a location where the crane can, can pick them from the site and be able to install them onto the buildings. Then uh, finally, just going into the actual installation. Um, so the, the, all of the planning and production culminates in, into to what happens on the site and whether the project is going to be efficient or not. And the start of that um, is going to be your lift, lift plans. Uh, it's the planning and, and the sequence of of the installation, um, taking into account uh, the, the panel configuration, um, making sure that we have them available on site. Um, the, the, the project you can see in the picture um, in the middle of London, you can see is a, a very congested site. So we, we can't have a fleet of trailers uh, waiting uh, to be offloaded. And so we have to make sure that they are arriving on time. Um, planning the cranes uh, for the project is normally done by the main contractor at a very early stage, but obviously the availability of the, of the models from the design um, and knowing the, the element size and the shape of them um, is going to determine what kind of a crane would be used. Um, on some occasions, we also have to use special lifting devices like the one in the picture, um, which is a cantilever to allow uh, access to underslung elements. So the crane capacity, uh, its size, its location and ability to pick um, has to be thought out from a very early stage before, the, the, before the, the, the actual foundations are cast of the project. Um, tilting and pitching, some elements um, could be quite large and not necessarily elements that are able to be delivered underneath bridges and, and restrictions on roads. 
So they might come to the site in an orientation which is different to the actual erection position. And these would need to be tilted or pitched on the site. Uh, this, is, this could be done through uh, tilting frames or, or just uh, multiple cranes. Um, but it needs to again be, be thought out before the elements arrive to the site on how they're going to physically be installed. And then uh, finally, just on to, to fixing methods, there's, there's again a multiple um, methods of how the panel can be fixed to, to the sites. Um, typically, it would either be a mechanical fixing, uh, so a, a, a bolted connection or something like that, or there could be an in situ corbel, which could be grouted and, and cast into position. <clears throat> so I think I've gone through that quite quickly, but I'll just maybe run through in, in summary and conclusion. Um, the, the design is, a, is vital. We need to be at a very early stage planning for precast. So we need to be looking what are the best systems, how would they suit the project best, and which components we could actually use for the project. Then planning, and I, I can't stress enough how important the planning side of precast is. We have to look at reducing opportunity for problems. The planning has to start at the end of the project and work its way back through um, all of the different stages and all of the different components and how everything links together to ensure that the, the precast elements that arrive to the site are the correct ones arriving at the correct time and able to fit perfectly into, into the structural system that we have. Um, this, this, this planning part involves uh, a multitude of people and the, the project management of that is, is critical. The production, obviously the production and precast relies on efficient uh, production with quality products. So during the production phase, the, the, the quality checks of what is happening um, eliminates any issues that might arise onto the site and allows, again, the, the efficient installation. Um, the installation, again, allows for, for expedited programs and, and, and tidy sites, um, keeping the number of people on site to a minimum, and it has to be, again, carefully planned. Um, so I think I've gone through that quite quickly, um, but I think that's the end from my side, if there's any questions then from there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Okay, we are now entering the Q&A session. Is there any question from the participants? You can just raise your hand or put the question in the chat box. Anyone? Okay, Mr. Palmer, let me uh, ask the first question. Uh, you mentioned about the, the importance of the planning, of all planning, uh, and the first stage of that is procurement from, from the, the manufacturer, okay? So you have to make safe uh, the, the supply of the elements can match the speed of the construction. All right. So, to, in your experience, do you have any any problem if you use two suppliers from from uh, for one project? Is there any difficulty that you face? Maybe from the the delivery schedule or the quality difference? Maybe. Oh, still muted. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I've worked on, on several projects where um, both the, the main contractor has used multiple um, producers, but I've also worked on projects where the, the precasters have collaborated together. Um, I, see. I think, I think the, again, it goes, does go back to, to planning um, and to make sure that both of the, both of the, or both of the producers have the correct elements ready at the correct time and are delivered together. Um, 
you know, it, it, it doesn't help that uh, the one, one producer is running off and producing a wall panel um, where the, the other producer hasn't got his, his components ready on time. Um, an alternative to that would be splitting. Um, if you have multiple buildings on one project, you could split the two buildings between two contractors. Um, mm. I think on, on the big mega projects, it's probably, probably wise to, to have multiple uh, producers involved uh, just to, to eliminate the risk that the, the main contractor and the client would face if one of the producers ran into an issue. I see. Okay. So it's not necessarily a drop there. It's uh, actually... Uh... Yeah, again, I think it's not a, not a, a, a one-fits-all. For example, on, a, on an architectural project, um, you want to make sure that you have one source of production for one type of panel. Mm. Um, to make constant finish, quality. Yeah, you, yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't want two different finishes on the panel. <laughs> okay. I mean, as it is within, within one factory, it can be quite difficult to keep colors and finishes consistent. So I think it needs to be taken into account what the project is um, mm. and, and what the elements are that we would be splitting between two different people. Okay, makes sense. Thank you for the answer. Uh, okay, I'm still waiting for question from the participants. Is there anyone have any questions? Pak Gunawan, maybe <laughs> the previous presenter. You have no questions. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, Mr. Uh, Palmer, Pak Gunawan here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I would like to uh, ask regarding the sequence. For example, uh, <clears throat> I mean, for example, on site, the sequence is from panel A, B, C, D, until Z. <clears throat> so in your casting yard, uh, do you cast the panel in the same sequence, A, B, C, D, or in the reverse uh, order, the, the, the sequence? Okay. Um, what we would tend to do is have a look at repetition, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, if we say you've got panels A, B, C, and say A, B, C to E, um, and panel A and E are identical, and panel uh, B and D are identical, and panel C is a different panel altogether, what we would look to do is try to cast A and E from one mold, so they would run one day, then the next day, and then C and D from a different mold, and then in order to, to maximize the mold usage, what you don't want to be doing is, is changing molds every day. So that means you want to try and cast in a sequence that maximizes the mold usage. Um, you would also try and cast into in the sequence that it would be installed at site. So if your install sequence is A, B, C, D, you want to try and get them ready in the sequence of A, B, C, D. Um, that isn't always, doesn't always fit with uh, with your production methodology. So you then need to maybe start producing a little bit earlier. Um, on, on some projects, we would maybe start a month before the elements are required on site in order to maximize the use. So we're balancing the, the number of elements that would be in the stockyard versus um, the efficiency of producing and the molds. So um, the, I think, uh, the, the reverse would be, again, when you, also when you're looking at um, installing, you have to make sure that the elements are loaded onto the trailer in the order of erection. So if you have six elements on one trailer and you're going to be erecting them A, B, C, D, E, F, you want to make sure that they're loaded on the trailer in reverse order oh. so that when they come to the site, the first element that can be picked is the A panel. Um, and that would then go on, on in the correct sequence. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, for the answer. I'm still looking for the next question. Is there any? Uh, yeah. I. Okay. Dr. Like Dr. Anthony, to ask please. a question also. Uh, previous uh, webinars, we discussed about the application of uh, precast on the seismic region. So uh, my question to Mr. Palmer is, is there any uh, 
experience in your your experience at using a precast uh, member uh, in the seismic region uh, building and what is the difference between the the common uh, connection and the one that is uh, required to be seismic resistant um I'll, I'll i'll start i'll start with a caveat saying i'm not a structural engineer <laughs> so my my answer might not be 100 percent correct but uh yeah um i was working in the middle east um in dubai and they it is a seismic zone um and they have two different zones uh, depending on the height of building that would be would be built um obviously if you're going to be considering um the seismic forces onto a building your connections need to be more rigid. Uh, so what we would tend to see is that you'd have to make sure that your shear resistance is taken um, through the shear cores and through the connections. Uh, typically what that would mean is that if take for example, a column beam frame, um, rather than using a pinned connection um, for the column and beam, you'd end up with a continuous, a continuous beam. So the way that would be done um, the most efficient way of connecting um, columns to beams for erection is to use a multiple height column, so maybe a, a three-story column with a corbel, and then you just place the place the beam onto the corbel, and you can you can erect quickly. However, for uh, for a seismic area, you would need to make sure that that connection um, is a more rigid connection. So you'd end up having to to have part casts where you would have an in situ stitch connecting the the beam to the column. So um, from, from, from perspective, anything in Dubai over two stories um, has to have the uh, seismic considerations on it. Um, and that has to be taken into account into, into the modeling that's done. Um, typically we would be using Tecla or Revit and the seismic forces would be taken into account into that. And then the connection details design in line um, with the, the outcome from the models. Okay. Is that answering your question, Anthony? I think so, yeah. Okay, uh, I saw earlier that Pak Danny raised his hand. We can, the committee, please uh, unmute Pak Danny. Okay. okay. Mr. Matthew, I I saw uh, in your presentation a very nice uh, cladding yeah for the wall. And further, I see when I see your uh, company Techrit, you do a lot of uh, different type of uh, cladding system for the wall. Uh, nowadays, uh, in your in your experience, how is the the market uh, requirement for the cladding? I mean, is it is it increasing or? Uh, still more mostly the plain plain uh, concrete um well we we as a, as a company only produce architectural concrete um that, that's all we do um i think there is a trend that currently that the, there is a lot more um precast being used as cladding i think we've seen it across across the world where um the the cladding systems that have been used are very susceptible to fire um and concrete offers a good solution to have a decorative finish that is fire resistant. Um, so there is a trend to towards using it. Um, something that we would do, and again, if you if you do have a look on our website, is what we are tending to do as well is more towards an envelope. Um, so we we're, we're actually rather than just a precast cladding company, we're we're looking to more towards the whole the whole envelope of the system. Um, so we actually uh, install the windows complete in the factory as well um, and do part of the, the, the insulation um, also gets installed uh, in the factory before the panel would be shipped to site. So when, when the element comes to the site, you have your almost have your full um, curtain wall um, in place. So you have the, the decorative panel and you have the window and the insulation, particularly backing up to columns and structural components, is already installed on the panel uh, to speed up the process. I think it's a, it's a bit more of a benefit here as well, where you have the, the weather, um, you have the cold winter weather and you have the rain, um, and it eliminates the need to do finishing of panels um, externally in bad weather. 
and, and also eliminates the, the need for window fitters to be working outside of a building, um, particularly multi-story buildings. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay, Mr. Palmer, I have one more question for you. Uh, during the storage, okay. In TechGrid, do you allow the elements to be stacked on top of each other vertically without any racks? Um, the, the type of panels we produce, um, the, there are a few of those elements that can be stacked on top. Mm -hmm. um, that would normally be uh, your either a column uh, or a beam type of element. Where they can, um, where they can actually rest against each other, um, okay. they wouldn't necessarily need to be in a rack. But obviously, the, the stack needs to be structurally secured, so I you see. don't want something to fall over. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you have to look at the the element itself. Is it structurally capable of having multiple panels placed on top of it? Mm -hmm. um, so, for for example, not an element we produce, but if you look at holical slabs. Um, you can stack a certain number of them on top of each other. Um, and same with any, any kind of column and beam system, you can do that. Okay, but should, it should be carefully designed, yeah. right? The stage, the storing. Okay, I think we have one question in the chat room from Mr. Arif Vibowo. What is the most suitable cement type to be used with your precast production system? Um, again, technical question. <laughs> I don't necessarily <laughs> have that. I don't have that answer. I mean, obviously, what we're using is is a is a is a white cement. Um, uh, we we look at a, a rapid hardening white cements um, in order to to get the uh, the early gain strength. Uh, do you use wet casting? or dry casting in, in tech grid? Um, it's, it, it's, all, it's all wet cast. Um, the concrete we tend to use would be self-compacting um, mm. where, where possible, particularly on the, the more complicated shapes uh, to allow to allow the an equal distribution of, of the aggregates within the face if possible. Okay, next question from Mr. or Ms. Mimi, I'm not sure. What is your advice on planning, erection, and installation of precast wall and precast slab for 12-story apartments in hilly area? Sorry, what was the last part? In hilly area. Hilly area. <laughs> um, okay, I, I think the, the, the process is going to be similar to what I've described. So you what we want to first have a look at is is the, the sequence of erection. How are we going to go about um, the, the, the sequence? Are we going to go up a single face? Is it, is it, a, is it a structural system or is it a cladding system? Mm. I think the, with a the cladding system, you have a little bit more flexibility as you can go one elevation at a time. Um, yeah. With a structural system, you have to, you have to progress um, floor by floor. Um, in, in a way to make the, 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 the building structurally sound as you go up. So the planning would start from the, the, the erection sequence. Um, then you would know which, which order you want your panels to arrive on site, um, and then make sure that your production is in, a, in an order that you have the correct elements ready at the right time. Um, I don't know, for the, for the hilly, hilly side of things, I would, would think you need to have a look at the access, make sure that your that the trailers and the tractor units that you're going to be used are able to get to the site. Um, you might end up having to use a smaller, a smaller trailer with less elements on Those it. Segments. Yeah. yeah, to get to get up the hills. Um, and again, make sure that your crane capacity is suited to to the size of the elements that you're going to be bringing. Um, the obviously what we want to try and do is maximize the size of a panel. Um, to minimize the number of panels that have to be erected. But that is then also balanced against the access at the site and the crane capacity. If you have a crane that can only lift six tons, you can't make a panel that is 10 tons big because you're not going to be able to, to get it to the site and install it. So that also is determined by 
by that uh, that limitation. I see. Okay. Uh, uh, next question again from Mr. Arif. Uh, how do you make it sure there will be no leak in your plating precast product? The connection maybe. Um, uh, I assume you're talking about the the joints between between molds. Um, now this this is um, we would normally make sure that you have to have a compressible filler in between the two molds, um, or there's a use of of mastic. Um, so you just take a small bit of mastic and mastic again up against the joint, a very small small bead of of, of silicone mastic um, that just allows prevents the ground leakage. Um, I see. So obviously, what you do not want is honeycombing in the face. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a next question from Mr. Jiong Chung Eng. Uh, sometimes there will be cast in plates. Oh, sorry, a steel connection, uh, mechanical and electrical services, with which need to cast in the precast elements. Okay. And this cast in items belongs to others. Do you request the related subcon to send their own people to fix it? their own or allow your own man to fix it who will be liable is the position of the gas in item no not correct oh okay uh, can you um, can you catch the question yeah yeah, got that <laughs> one, yeah um we we tend to do the installation of the casting items ourselves um okay. and the the positioning of that forms part of the qc check so um, what we have is we have a, a QC inspector. Um, we, he has a, a tablet, um, and on the tablet we would have a, a PDF version of the of the manufacturing drawing. He would then check each of the key dimensions, and the, the dimensions for the casting components would be on that, and he would mark them as being correct. And then post cast, there would be another inspection, and again because these might have moved during casting um, or might have gotten covered with concrete during casting. So again, they would be checked at the off at the postcast and make sure that they are correct. And if there isn't, um, go back to engineering and get a method for rectifying any, any damages that might have occurred. Okay. Um, I think... the, and I think the, the cost of that is included into, into what we produce. So we know we're going to be doing it. So we, we include the cost into what we do. Okay. Having all the procedures done, uh, who will be liable if the position is still incorrect? Um, the way we the way we manage it, we are responsible for that. Um, you know, if if the if the information that came from um, from the client or or the other contractor was incorrect, in other words, he wanted it one meter from the end, we put it one meter from the end, and that was what was shown on drawings, and then. Mm -hmm. um, he comes back and says, no, no, actually it was supposed to be 1.2, then he's liable for that. Okay. Um, but if it's if, if, we have, if we're given the correct information, we, we should be able to, to get it in the right position and we should be responsible for that. Okay. 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 Uh, next question from Mr. Fito. Uh, buildings made with precast elements are known for its relatively shorter duration of construction, okay, construction speed is, is better. In terms of construction safety and construction worker productivity, are precast elements that significantly better that an investment towards this precast technology is acceptable? Um, I think, I think um, one of the, the safety issues, um, obviously lifting heavy elements can be a risky activity. Uh, so the lift plan, needs to be done properly and you need to have a proper appointed person at the site controlling the lifts and making sure they are done correctly. But I do, I do believe that the benefit for, for the construction site safety wise is mm -hmm. that you have less people on the site. If you take, for example, a column beam frame, if it was to be done in situ, you would need scaffolders, you would need the carpenters to build, the rein, you need reinforcers to, to fix things. You would then be casting wet cast concrete, so you'd have trucks and concrete pumps moving around the site. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're eliminating those people on the site, you have a 
a smaller workforce, which is easier to control and a safer working environment. And a big part of construction um, sites is the waste materials that are on site, whether it be timber reinforcement or concrete blocks. Um, mm -hmm. And again, waste on a site creates an untidy site and is difficult to manage and creates opportunity for accidents. So I think the by taking that off site onto a controlled factory environment, that's where the, the safety benefits come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have still one question uh, from Mr. Arif. Uh, when is the best time for pre-stress transfer and demolding in your precast cast production system? Um, now, uh, what we would do is at the time of casting um, the concrete, we would take molds, uh, so we would take cubes, sorry, um, mm. which would allow us to crush just to ensure that we have reached the correct, or we could use a, a Schmidt hammer to make sure that we've achieved the correct strength. Now, if you take a pre-stressed uh, beam run where you maybe have 100 meters of, of pre-stressing strands, you might have eight or 10 beams um, in that run. So your, your de-stressing would be from when the last beam in that run has achieved its correct strength. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, which is normally around 42 or 45 newtons, depending on, on the stressing forces that have been designed into, into the strands. But you're always looking at, at maximizing that. Okay, so basically you have uh, uh, something to, to compare, yeah? The yes, quality yeah, of the, yeah. the concrete. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of it is, is also based on, on, on the experience over many mm -hmm. years of doing it. You know, you know more or less when something will be ready um, and the guys can visually tell, yeah, it, with, especially with the Schmidt hammer, yeah, we've reached the correct strength, we can de-stress now. Okay. And just, just on that, I mean, obviously the cycle for pre-stressing um, tends to be that you are utilizing a, a pre-stressing bed uh, twice in three days. Uh, you're not getting daily casting like you would for most um, most elements. Um, another thing to consider uh, with the early strength is obviously there's a, a tend now towards um, obviously environmental green issues, implementing GGBS into concretes, um, yeah. which which impacts precast in the fact that it slows down the early strength gains. So that also needs to be considered. I see. Okay. Uh, do we still have any questions for Mr. Palmer? I'm still waiting. I don't see any more question right now. Anyone? It's still morning. Okay, <laughs> so Mr. Palmer is full, still I, full of energy. I, I can go. I can go some breakfast. <laughs> if okay. there's no more questions. <laughs> okay, if uh, there is no more question, uh, can we wrap this session, Pak Anthony? Ha, huh, still yeah. one more, <laughs> Mr. Palmer. Yeah. Did you use any additive when you were product producting the precast elements? Yes, I mean it's not a standard mix, but there would always be typically a super plasticizer in, uh, right. particularly on the self-compacting concretes. Sure, um, sure. And other than that, I mean we're we're also looking towards using, um, trying to get ultra high performance concretes and those kind of things into into what we do. Uh, I think with the, with a green agenda now, it's important to try and uh, limit carbon content. So uh, I think that's the way the mix designs are going to be going. Okay. Uh, okay. I have uh, one more question, actually. Like, uh, for your from your experience in the fourteen year that you have become a engineer and then the plant manager, uh, what is the most challenging uh, like uh, event that you you encountered? Yeah. So I think that should be uh, giving us like what is the challenging of the application of precast and or or the the one that uh, in your experience. Um, probably not the answer you're going to want to hear, but it's managing people <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and managing client expectations, I think, is, 
you know, um, and unfortunately, we, we have to, to, to manage people. The concrete mm -hmm. is easy. You know, concrete, concrete is easy. Con concrete's a recipe. You put, you, put, you put a few components together, you bake a cake, and then you put it into a mold, <laughs> and then there you go. You've got concrete. Um, I, I think it's, it's making, getting people to work together as teams. Uh, managing people, managing a group. So managing the, the clients, um, the architects, the consultants, project managers, and making sure that everybody works together to deliver a successful project. So mm. for me, I think um, you know, for the, the best project I've worked on is, is where everybody does work together and pull together. And you know, we come out at the end with a, delivering the, the, the project on time for the client and meeting the client's expectations. Very, very fruitful answer from the last questions. <laughs> But I don't think it's the last. We have still one more question. Uh, Mr. Palmer, which one, uh, which one do you often, uh, how do I, which one you often, okay, okay, okay. The type of the, of the stressing bar, do you use, which one is more often, PC bar, PC wire, or PC strand? Um. In my experience, mostly what we've used would be would be the strands. Um, strands. They're coming in coils, and then the different, obviously, depending on on the project specifications, um, it would and and the requirements would be the diameter of the strands. Um, so you could have ASTM or, or British standard strands as the two uh -huh. typical ones, and then there's two different diameters or three different diameters that come along with that, and depending on. On the forces that you're going to be putting through, it would depend what you what you would use, but typically it would be strand coils. Okay, thank you. I think we can finish this, the the session, uh, Mr. Palmer. Thank you again for your sharing, very insightful information, and thank you for the all the participants for the for joining the session until this afternoon. So I give the time back to Pak Antoni and Tim. Uh, Have a yeah. nice breakfast, Mr. Palmer, <laughs> and good afternoon meal for everyone else. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Palmer, for your uh, speech. And thank you for uh, today's speaker, uh, Mr. Palmer and Pak Gunawan. So I hope that everyone have a fruitful uh, session for today. So I have some uh, announcement. So please uh, stay with me for a while while the uh, my my team can share the link for the questionnaire so uh, this is the third webinar series uh, that we have done so today is the precast manufacturing from planning to delivery and construction so i hope that everyone have a good uh, experience and then previously we have done the first and then the second And uh, next two weeks, uh, on the 9th of October, we have uh, one session uh, from one o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. But uh, I would like to announce that, that uh, there is some change of uh, time for the 23rd of October. So we will ask uh, Professor Sri Taran to uh, speak And then he is from uh, United States, so the time difference is uh, 12 hours. So we will start the session from nine o'clock. Uh, please, uh, we will also inform you by email. So this is the uh, next uh, four weeks. Yeah. So and then uh, we still have a session for the six and seven webinar. So I think uh, that is my uh, information. So announcement, okay. Okay, uh, <laughs> I think everything is good. So please fill out the questionnaire when you leave and we can end the session for uh, the webinar session for today. Thank you, everyone.